the late news hour with Phil Williams on Five Live. It's been called the worst ever NHS disaster, causing the deaths of around 3,000 people and blighting the lives of thousands more. A public inquiry opened today which will try to find out how NHS patients were given infected blood products during the 1970s and 1980s. There have been previous inquiries into the scandal, but this is the first UK-wide public inquiry that has the power to compel witnesses to testify, including former ministers. Retired Judge Sir Brian Langstaff made it clear he will seek the truth about what happened. We have already requested a number of documents which we would not have got had this not been a statutory inquiry. It is willing to hold people to account where appropriate and it will express its views at the end without fear or favour, affection or ill will. We can discuss this with Jason Evans, who's the founder of Factor 8, an independent haemophilia group. Jason's father died in 1993 after being infected with hepatitis C and HIV. Jason, welcome to the programme. Good evening. And Sue Wathens, primary school teacher from East Northamptonshire, who contracted hep C from a contaminated blood transfusion. Uh, Sue, evening to you as well. I'll get to you in a moment. But Jason, first of all today, how momentous was the opening day of this UK-wide public inquiry for you? Just to give people a, a sense of how long you've been calling for this. Yeah, I think it was... Uh excuse me, an extremely momentous day for the whole community. Um, I mean, for me personally, my involvement in campaigning has been nothing really in, in comparison to uh, people that have been living this their entire uh, adult lives. Uh, I mean, I really began campaigning seriously in um, 2015. Um, I began getting involved in research and putting together Factor 8 as an organisation. And we had one goal, and that goal was to secure a full public inquiry into this thing that we call the contaminated blood scandal. In July 2017, that goal was realised when Theresa May announced there would be an inquiry. It took uh, a year and a half to actually get it underway, uh, but it is finally underway, and so I think uh, very vindicating for, for myself and, and others today. What happened to your dad? So my dad was born with a condition called haemophilia, which uh, prevents its uh, where well, you're missing a protein actually called factor eight from your blood, which um, means that your blood doesn't clot uh, properly. And for that, the treatment is replacement of the missing factor eight protein. Um, in the mid to late uh, 1960s and into the early 1970s, the treatment for that condition was called cryoprecipitate, um, which in a way, similar to a blood transfusion, came from a single, uh, each unit came from a single volunteer British NHS donor. In the uh, mid-70s and through to the uh, mid-1980s, that treatment changed. And it changed from uh, these goodwill volunteer donations to a commercialized pharmaceutical medicine called factor concentrate and the difference with these products was that um, they were made by mixing together the blood plasma donations of tens of thousands of donors who uh, were often paid for their donation because um, the plasma was being collected overseas where the regulation was much different um, paying donors had long been known to give people a motive to lie about their health status, their lifestyle. Uh, plasma was collected in, in prisons. It attracted prostitutes and IV drug users. And so this was really a disaster waiting to happen from the outset for the haemophilia community who were sold these products by these companies as a, a great new thing for them. Uh, Sue Wathens, a primary school teacher in East Northamptonshire. Sue, what happened to you? Well, I covered in 2014 that I had been um, given a, a contaminated blood transfusion way back in the late 70s, early 80s. Um, so it took all that time before anybody even thought to ask me, had I had a blood transfusion and subsequently tested me. Is that, so, so that's why diagnosis took so long? Um, I'd, yes, because, um, hep hepatitis C 
in particular it is is it's often known as the violent killer because it um the symptoms of it replicate other things and sometimes it's quite insidious it's very tiring it um it damages your immune system so you pick up random things that are wrong with you but it isn't a disease that presents in any one particular way um and so people actually can die of it without ever knowing they've got it um so it's it's it was something that i i wasn't even aware that i could have contracted it i was in blissful ignorance that um there was any such thing as contaminated blood were you aware at the time when you were receiving a blood um, transfusion that whether your blood had been screened or not absolutely not it just didn't enter my head and, and i um i just don't think you even thought about it i was discussing it earlier with my son and um and we were saying i wonder why we didn't think or did we just assume that all blood was screened? I don't know if it even I even thought about it. You just, as you're in hospital being treated, you assume that what you're being given is safe. So I didn't really think beyond that. Um, as I say, blissful ignorance until I found out that I was had been given hepatitis C, and. From then on, it's been a very steep learning curve on what that is and how to get the treatment for it. Yeah, my understanding of it, Sue, is is that normally uh, for what you have, the treatment would involve a huge, uh, uh, lengthy period of chemotherapy, but you avoided that, didn't you? I did. Um, I Well, when... Um, when I knew what the treatment involved and I'd actually spoken to um, people at, I joined the Hep C Trust when I found out because I thought this is a way of 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 making myself aware of what the disease is and and get in touch with other people who have it. Um, so I went to their patient conference and I spoke to um, a man who was actually on his third round of of this chemotherapy treatment, and he had just given up and he said. Um, let me tell you, I'd rather be dead. It was so awful. Um, so I thought, no. I mean, I was fortunate, very fortunate, in the sense that I wasn't diagnosed until 2014 because by then, these new direct-acting antiviral drugs were coming online. And um, once they had been licensed for use by the NHS, by NICE, um, I thought, I'm going to have that. And uh, although Adam Brooks Clinical Commissioning Group didn't think I should have it, two occasions um, I was turned down. Um, I went to my MP, my local MP, and he was very, very good and helped me to fight. And um, we were successful. And I had... This tr the treatment, which instead of a year's worth of treatment with uh, multiple side effects, I had eight weeks of treatment, which consisted of one tablet per day um, with one side effect, which was headaches. And in our two weeks after commencing the treatment, I, my viral load, which is how they measure um, the amount of virus in your blood, went down from 2,900,000 to zero. So it was, it was um, extremely successful and very quickly. And when you have hepatitis C, what, what are the symptoms? Well, the symptoms are fatigue. Um, they are, um, it damages your immune system, so you fall prey to any number of, um, weird and wonderful viruses or um, different things that can go wrong with you. I had um, I had something that affected my skin, which was called pentagoid, which I again I'd never heard of, and um, it, it was a, it was akin to these large blood blisters um, about the size of the old half pea 
um, coin. Um, on the Oh, we've lost Sue's line, haven't we? I'm sorry about that. We'll see if we can get it restored. Jason Evans, let me come back to you as the founder of Factor 8. Without wishing to prejudge the outcome of this public inquiry, are you confident that it has the parameters you want it to have in order for the truth to emerge? Yeah, I think um, I and, and the rest of the community actually are, are very confident in the terms of reference. And I think um, we have a very good factual matrix to assist the inquiry uh, from Factor 8 and some of the other core participants as well, um, especially our legal representation at Collins Solicitors who have been massively helpful. Uh, and I, th I think it, it would be good um, to perhaps just clarify because I think some of the information today may have caused some undue alarm to people that received blood transfusions in the 70s and 80s. And so to just give a brief um overview of, of that time period. So hepatitis C as a virus was first described um, in the early to mid uh, 1970s. It was then called non-A, non-B hepatitis. And the prevalence rate in the UK population was somewhere between 0.1 to 1%. And therefore, a one unit of blood would present a risk of around 0.1% in the case of blood transfusion. And of course, um, a test to screen for that virus was not uh, available until around 1988. Well, that was actually just for the antibodies to the virus. And then the test for the actual virus, uh, virus came uh, later on in the early 1990s. Um, and so what I would say to people that uh, had a blood transfusion during the material time is yes, it is a good idea to be tested for hepatitis. However, the risk for a blood transfusion um, is extremely, extremely small. However, uh, for those who were using uh, factor eight and nine concentrate products, the exposure rate was actually 100%. And so um, those people are, are, are at uh, a, a great risk. And in fact, I would say that most of those people infected that way would, would already know. But just to put that in some some context just to save any undue alarm thank you for doing that i appreciate it jason that's jason evans founder of factor eight the independent haemophilia group jason's father died in 1993 after being infected with hep c and hiv from blood that he received and sue watham before that apologies for losing sue's line just towards the end of that interview sue primary school teacher from east northamptonshire who contracted hepatitis c from a contaminated blood transfusion in the late 70s early 80s that public inquiry continues